It is great to be here this morning. Um, I, I will say, uh, I actually changed the name of my sermon since I changed the sign, um, but I didn't get a chance to go to rechange the sign, so the sign has a different, it do, doesn't matter. Anyway, the new ter- sermon title is When Work Doesn't Work, okay? Thought it was fun, catchy, memorable. Uh, anyway, for those of you that may not know me, uh, my name is Jeff, uh, my beautiful wife Jessica up there in the sound booth. Uh, we are the youth pastors here at Grace, and um, I get to bring the message every once in a while. Um, and we have a little adorable girl that thinks she owns this church. Her name is London, and she is just about to turn three. And uh, Yes, she, she is a blessing. Uh, how many like, parents, grandparents do we have in here? We have? Okay. All right. Awesome. So I'm, I'm speaking to my people now, because when I tell, like, dad stories, the kids don't get it, all right? So we, we kind of know as parents, and I just want you guys to know as parents and as grandparents that while working with youth, I can really see the impact that the, the parents and the family, the close family that's pouring into them, what kind of impact they are having. So even when it seems like they're just stuck in their phones and not listening, they are. They're actually hearing you. And, and so they are paying attention. I just want to leave you with that encouragement. Now... We are, <laughs> I just want you to, yeah, in case you're wondering, they, they do hear, they do, even though they seem like they're ignoring you. That's the cool thing to do. Um, for us, we're raising a toddler. We don't expect it'll get any worse, right? You guys can reassure us of that, right? <laughs> yeah. We are raising a, a toddler who thinks she owns the world, okay? I'm pretty sure she does. Um, but I, I, as I was writing this message, it reminded me of our London's first like Christmas where she could interact with things Um, and the way she way her birthday falls is her first Christmas she was a few months old so eh, she didn't really get it her next Christmas she was about a year and a half so we were really excited that she was going to actually be able to you know open her own presents that she's going to see her new toy and just be so excited and just be jolly I remember we spent like weeks shopping I mean we didn't buy like big expensive things but we bought a lot of things And we spent all this time shopping, picking out the perfect gifts, picking out the perfect toy and the the clothes, which she really didn't care about those, but picking out the the perfect things for her. And then we were so shocked when Christmas morning came around and her biggest fascination was the wrapping paper. She uh, she was so like polite with it though. She would peel off like an inch long strip and then she would hand it to you and then she'd peel off another inch long strip and it. it took us about 22 minutes each present. But she was so fascinated with pulling off the little pieces of wrapping paper that she completely ignored the present itself. That as soon as this one was done and there was no more wrapping paper, she had moved on to the next. And then to the next, and to the next. And, and as I was thinking about that, we oftentimes get so focused on the details of things that we often miss the big picture, right? I, I know we're planning a third birthday coming up, and I know at least the last two, we get so fixated on the details of the party that we almost forget that it's in celebration of her birth, right? That so often in life we get so addicted to the details that we miss the big picture. Take, for instance, if you had your your favorite painter. Uh, If you don't have a favorite painter, let's just go with Da Vinci. Everyone knows him. And he was painting maybe The Last Supper. Now imagine you got the opportunity to witness Da Vinci painting this Last Supper, but imagine you got so fixated on the paintbrush, that the way that he, he dipped it in this color palette that you could tell was going to be leading to a masterpiece, and the way that he elegantly pushed it across the canvas, and the, the colors mixed together, and you just became so fascinated with the way the paintbrush moved that you never stepped back to see the whole picture. Then what you've done is you've been entertained, yes, but you've not got the message the artist was trying to communicate. While studying Romans 9, which is what we're going to be talking about today, I found this to be the case a lot that so many people got so fixated on the details and the theological arguments that they missed the big picture that Paul was trying to paint. That there is, within Romans 9, there are certain doctrinal arguments that people love to argue about. And I listened to so many sermons, read so many commentaries, that that's all they focused on when Paul was painting a much broader picture than that. So my... My goal today is to not get into the theological debates. I think we can go home and research that on our own. I want to focus on what Paul is actually saying to this first century Jewish audience and what it means to us here today. Because I believe if I get into that, what I'm going to do, someone here is going to disagree with me. We're non-denominational. We have 28 different backgrounds within this church. 
we're not all going to agree, so you're going to disagree with me, and then you're going to walk out, and it doesn't look good on the youth pastor, so let's not do that. And, but you disagree with me, so you're not going to listen to anything else I say, and then we miss the big picture all over again. So we're not even going to talk about those things. We're going to go through the scripture, and we're going to go through it, sort of how Paul would have intended it to this first century Jewish audience. We'll talk about what it meant to them, what it means to us here today. And we're going to talk about what God is saying to us, because I believe all scripture is God breathed, that Paul wrote it for a certain time, for a certain audience, but God intended it for all people. And we are all people, so it is intended for us. And we'll unpack it, how it is meant for us today. Sound good? All right, so I don't know if you guys have looked outside. It's actually not raining. I'm surprised too, because yes, let's praise God on that one. It is not raining, which means... Summer is hopefully almost here. I've never wanted summer so badly in my life, okay? <laughs> I'm, ready to, I'm ready to go to the parks to actually see what the outdoors look like. I'm ready to go hiking with our hiking group here at Gray's. I'm ready to go kayaking again. Um, do I have any more like kayakers in here or anyone who, yeah, okay, all right, there's a few of us or anyone else who likes a boat that doesn't have a motor? Okay, good. I can't afford the ones with motors, so I, I got paddles. So we love kayaking, but I will say, after a while, you get a little bit careless with kayaks, at least I do. Um, last year, I had my first incident in a kayak. I was just being dumb, ended up outside of said kayak. Now, the, the problem is, we, we go on kayaking trips like we're backpacking or something. Like We have our backpack with food and snacks, and we have our water bottle, and just we take everything we can with us on the kayak because nothing is ever going to go wrong. Um, so I'm outside of the kayak. My kayak is flipped over, and I'm looking around, and my stuff is just everywhere. <laughs> so like, I eventually swim around, get everything wrangled up, get it, my kayak flipped back over, everything thrown back up on the kayak, and I begin the process of trying to get myself back into the kayak without flipping it. I eventually do. Get settled in, get set, start looking around, and notice that my oar is about five feet away. <laughs> so I thought, it's not that far. Jessica's on up ahead a little bit. I'm like, I can get to that. So I, I begin trying to paddle myself. <laughs> and I, I'm like kicking and, and swinging and flailing and, and screaming. I'm going nowhere. <laughs> This kayak has not moved an inch, but the wake that I've created has now pushed the oar further away. <laughs> and I'm like, it really doesn't seem like a great idea to get out of my kayak and have to repeat this process. Finally, Jessica comes back over, and she helps me out and gets my paddle, brings it to me, and, and we're, we're okay. But I want to talk about that kind of stuck feeling, right? That, that feeling where you're, you're working so hard that you're fighting and you're flailing and you're screaming. You're putting everything you have in you into something, but it seems like you're not moving forward. I think that is something that obviously happens to me while kayaking, but I think it's something that happens to us in life, that so many of us are facing struggles and facing problems and facing situations that no matter how much we paddle, no matter how much we fight, or no matter how much we work, we don't seem to move forward. I imagine a lot of you in here are familiar with that feeling if you're not going through it currently. But maybe you're facing a, a family crisis. And no matter how much you talk, and no matter how much you love, and no matter how much you pray for them, it just seems to get worse. Or maybe you have a family member who is sick, and no matter how much you visit, no matter how much you hope, no matter how much you pray, they don't seem to be getting any better. Maybe you're struggling with a sin, and, and you've done all the right things. You've put in all the work, and you've been reading your Bible, and you've been coming to church, and you've been praying, and you've been trying you know, to, to get past this, and you've been operating. You've been putting your willpower to its test, but all that happens is you end up feeling worse when you fall back into it. Or maybe you've been trying to grow closer with God. And you've been doing all the right things. You've been in scripture, and you've been praying, and you've been talking, and you've been pleading, but you don't seem to hear anything back. When you're fighting with all you have, and you don't feel like you're moving forward, what do you do? When work doesn't work. Paul's going to be addressing these early Jewish people today, and this is the exact kind of situation they are in. 
They are the Israelites. They are the God's chosen people from like the beginning of time, from Abraham and forward. They are God's chosen people. Yet when the, new, when the Messiah came, it seems like all the Gentiles are being saved, but God's chosen people are not. And Paul is addressing this issue. Why is it that there are more Gentiles being saved than there are Jews? Well, we can read and pretty much know it's Jewish the stubbornness. Uh, we're all guilty of that too. But Paul is going to be addressing this topic here in chapter 9. So before I jump in, I want to talk about what Paul is going to be doing through this. It's going to help us understand the text so much better. If you, uh, if you read my blog post this week, we have a blog, blog.gcclive.com, uh, shameless plug. If you, if you read that, or if you didn't, I'll explain a little bit. Uh, I, I wrote a blog post called, What Does the Father Say About Jesus?, and in it, I mentioned these rabbinical teachings, so these, these, the way that the rabbis used to teach are actually very similar to how we teach still today, it, but the, one of their top methods of teaching was a, a strategy or a method we call stringing pearls. And so what they would do is they would take, during their talks, they would string together multiple Old Testament uh, stories or just, they would s- string together uh, you know, a word or two from an Old Testament story, and their audience, for the most part, would have had almost the entire Bible or the entire Old Testament memorized, or at the very least, they'd have had the entire Torah memorized, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. I know it's impressive, but what else are you going to do without Netflix? Um, they, they would, at least by the age of 11, they'd had the entire Torah memorized. So rabbis at this time, instead of repeating the entire passage, they would instead just mention a, a quick phrase. So I, I could do that here if I wanted to I wanted to say, I know exactly how God feels about this because he so loved the world. I obviously don't need to repeat the entire verse because you know what I'm talking about. When I say he so loved the world, you know that I'm referencing John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, right? You know immediately just from the context and from what I said that that's my reference. I don't need to repeat the whole verse. So a lot of the times these rabbinical teachers will teach just like that. And as we read... Um, in this, Paul references so many Old Testament stories. So almost nothing is, is exactly how it sounds at face value. If you want to look in the true context, you go back and read in context what Paul is referencing to. Um, and I, I had a screenshot, but I forgot to put it in, sorry. Uh, but it was when I first pulled up uh, Romans 9 on the YouVersion Bible app, in the first five verses, there was about 15 little bubbles. And that all of those were cross-references to something that Paul was referencing in the Old Testament. So there is a lot of context. And you can also look at this and know he was probably talking to Jews when he wrote this. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out because we'll be looking at a lot of Old Testament stuff that Paul is referencing too. So we'll start in Romans 9, uh, verse 1. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. I'm going to pause. Because right here, Paul makes it extremely clear who he's talking to. In this passage, he's talking to his Jewish brothers and sisters who do not know Christ. And what I love here is, is Paul's heart for the lost. If you really break down what he just said, he essentially said that he wishes he were able to give up his own salvation so that they could be saved. That Paul is willing to spend eternity in hell if it meant that his Jewish brothers and sisters could be saved. And as I'm reading this, I I just, what would the world look like today if Christians had the same heart for the lost? What kind of difference could we make If we went out into our county, into our state, into the United States, into the world with the kind of mentality that we love lost people so much that we are willing to give up our own salvation for them. Because if we're willing to spend eternity in hell for someone, there's nothing we won't do for them. What if we loved people like that? I mean, I think now we can see why Paul was okay with his ministry of suffering. Because he was willing to do anything he could to get people to Jesus. Because he knew the thing that mattered more than anything else is that lost people meet Jesus. So my first point in breaking a works-based mentality, 
a mentality that tells us that if we are good enough, if we work hard enough, then we will get good things. My first point, I want to ask the question, what are, what are we willing to do to see our friends meet Jesus? And the first point is exalt others before ourselves. Exalt others before ourselves. If we could lift others up, if we could focus on others, if we could love people the way that Jesus and the way that Paul loves people, and we could work on them, I believe God would use them to work on us. Because that, that mentality of selflessness builds something inside of each and every one of us. What if we love people the way Paul says he loved these lost people? Verse 4, Paul says, They are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors. And Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Paul is saying as Israelites, you have been chosen. You are God's chosen people. That you get the covenants, the promises, the patriarch, that that the, the Messiah himself comes from your lineage. And he goes on, because he, see, he sees an objection coming. He sees them asking, okay, if we are God's chosen people, why is it that the Gentiles are being chosen over us? Why are the Gentiles being saved more than us? Verse 6, well then, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? No, for not all who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. For the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Though Abraham had other children too, this means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. For God had promised, I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Now this to the Jews was uh, they would have understood exactly what Paul's talking about. I'll unpack it just for a moment. Uh, he, they're talking about Abraham, which is known as kind of the father of uh, Israel. So he is the one through whom all of Israel comes from. And, and when Abraham was very old, God already came to him and promised that he would be the father of many nations. And so Abraham waited and waited and waited and waited, and uh, no children came. Him and his wife Sarah were not able to have children. So they came up with their own plan. They're going to have their own child through Sarah's handmaiden, uh, a woman named Hagar. So they do, and they have a son named Ishmael. Now, Abraham begins raising Ishmael as though Ishmael is going to be the child of promise. And this is when God comes and he says, no, Ishmael is not the child of promise. I promised you a son, and you kind of went and did your own thing, but I'm still going to give you that son. Your son's going to be named Isaac. And through Isaac is the son of promise. So all the nations I promised you will come from Isaac. And so what Paul is saying here is that these Jews assumed just because they were of the lineage of Abraham that they were going to be saved. That they assumed just because they were Israelites that they were God's chosen people, that automatically meant they were saved. That there was nothing else to it. What Paul is saying here is, listen, Abraham's own biological children were not the children of promise only Isaac. So we can't assume that we are birthed into salvation. And, and I, I realize this time and time again is that there are a lot of Christians in churches today that believe they are born into salvation. That there are a lot of, a lot of Christians that live a nice Christian life without ever following Jesus. There are a lot of Christians that fill churches all throughout the world and they assume they have salvation because they simply attend church or because their grandparents did or their mom did or their uncle's a preacher and they've just always been in church. You see, there's a lot of Christians that assume they are saved without ever following Jesus. You see, the secret to salvation is that you actually make Jesus Lord. In the Greek there actually means master. We've made it a little more politically correct. Master as in the master of a slave. You make Jesus Lord and master of your life and then he becomes Savior. You never see Savior put before Lord. It's always Lord and Savior. Jesus himself says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? 
And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you, you who practice lawlessness. That is one of the most heartbreaking verses in the Bible. But I have to make sure we communicate this today. Because attending church doesn't make you a Christian. Pastor Dennis would say, sort of like being in a garage doesn't make you a car. The only thing that makes you a Christian is that you truly follow Jesus, that you give Jesus your entire life, that you accept him as Lord and Savior, that you believe in your heart that he is the Son of God and that he died for you and was resurrected from the dead. That is what saves you. Attending church, reading your Bible, praying all the time does not save you. Faith in Jesus alone is what saves you. This is what Paul's trying to communicate to these Jewish, these early Jewish people, is that all of these works that you're working at, those don't save you. Faith in Jesus alone is the only thing that can save you. My second point is that we exalt God above ourselves. We exalt God above ourselves. That we realize that it is not us that can save ourselves. That if it is based on our own merit, our own goodness, our own works, we will fail every single time. That's why we put our faith and trust and hope in Jesus alone, because Jesus is faithful to save us. Paul goes on in verse 10. This son was our ancestor Isaac. When he married Rebekah, she gave birth to twins. But before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that, that God chooses people according to his purposes. He calls people not according to their good or bad works. She was told, your, young, your older son will serve your younger son. In the words of the scriptures, I loved Jacob, but rejected Esau. And that is, NLT puts it very lightly. Uh, most translations say, I loved Jacob, but Esau I hated. Let's unpack that for a moment. Because that one, that one is a hard one to swallow. Where we immediately think, I thought God didn't hate anyone. What exactly is Paul saying here? So this is a direct, uh, if you're reading it in your Bible, you'll probably see a little A or something under it or, or some sort of letter. This is a direct reference from Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3. And in it, Malachi is saying, he uses the names Jacob and, I, or, yes, Jacob and Esau, but what he's talking about is he's talking about the nations that were to come from the two. He's talking about the nation of Israel, which came from Jacob, and the nation of Edom, which came from Esau. So he's not referring to specific people, he's referring to the nations. That really doesn't clear it up, does it? Because we're still saying God hates an entire nation. All right, so let's clear that part up. So again, this is where you really have to dive into the text sometimes to understand what's going on. This word hate that's used here, this word hate is the word maseo, maseo. And what it means is it's the same word that Jesus actually uses in Luke 14, 26. And he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, if we read the rest of Scripture, we will know that is obviously not what Jesus meant. Numerous times does he tell us to respect our mother and father, to love our wives as we love ourselves. He tells us numerous times to, you know, take care of our children, that all through Scripture we are told to love people. So why is Jesus in this one verse telling us to hate people? Well, the word here is the word maseo, and it's, it's more of a comparative term. That rather than to all out hate someone, that in comparison to how much you love Jesus, you hate everything else. So in comparison, because I love Jesus so much that my love for everything else is down here. In comparison, I hate everything else because I love Jesus so much. So what God is saying here, it's not that I hate the nation of Edom. It's that I love my chosen children. I love my chosen people, the people that I'm going to lift up and free. I love them so much that in comparison to how much I love them, I hate everything else. Which is good news for you and me because when Jesus came and spread his arms on the cross, we became God's chosen people. And in comparison to how much he loves you, he hates everything else. That no matter what you've done or where you've gone, God loves you. To, to, to bring my daughter back into this because she's cute. Um, <laughs> London loves chicken nuggets. She does. If I ask her what she wants to eat, she'll always say chicken nuggets. 
However, if I give her chicken nuggets and then lay M&Ms anywhere that she can smell them, she'll say, I know like chicken, I M&Ms. So she'll say, exactly, every single time. She loves chicken nuggets, she really does, but in comparison to that chocolatey goodness, she hates, hates chicken nuggets, right? That's what God's saying, is not that he hates Esau, but in comparison to how much he loves Israel, in comparison to how much he loves his people, he hates them, okay? And that's exactly what we're called to do in Luke 14, 26. It's not that we hate our mother and brother and everyone else. It's that we love Jesus so much that we hate everything else. So the next step is exalt Jesus above all. Exalt Jesus above all. That all things, when compared to Jesus, are hated. All good things, too. Things that bring you pleasure. Your motorboat that I can't afford. Your, your car, your job, your finances, your marriage. In comparison to how much you love Jesus, those things should be nothing. Not that they are nothing, but you should love Jesus that much. Starting back in verse 14, Paul says, Are we saying then that God was unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to some and he chooses to harden the hearts of others so they refuse to listen. Well, then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? Now here, Paul is making a huge reference. This reference he's making is uh, called the Passover, and this is essentially the Jewish Christmas. This is their, their biggest deal. This is their biggest celebration. Their biggest feast is Passover. They would have been incredibly familiar with this story. Now, it goes like this, that the Israelites were in Egypt, and they were being enslaved by a cruel pharaoh. This guy was pretty bad. He would he forced them to work. He forced them to do as much as he said. At one time, he called that all of their male children be killed. He just was not a great guy. So then God lifts up a man by the name of Moses. And there's a whole lot going on with Moses, but he lifts Moses up and he says, Moses, you're going to be the one that goes and frees the Israelites. So you remember in the story that Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, you know, let my people go. You can probably remember the song. Let my people go, let my people go. And all throughout that text, it says something along the lines of Pharaoh hardened his heart or God hardened his heart. Okay, that was always kind of a tough one because when I first tried to read the Bible, I started in Genesis and was a little bit confused by that. I got real confused by Leviticus. But, but God hardened his heart. Why would God do that? Because if, if Pharaoh had softened his heart and let them go, well, they'd have been gone earlier. Less plagues would have had to come down. So why would God have hardened the heart of Pharaoh so that he would not let the Israelites go? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not here to answer all the questions, but I do know this, that God is far superior than we are, right? God knows the past, the present, the future. He is omnipotent and omnipresent. He knows all things. He doesn't see a timeline like we do. He sees all things at once. So I have to assume that because I trust God, that I believe that he's going to work all things together for the good of those who love him, that have been called according to his purpose, that because I trust God, I assume he does the things that he does for my good, right? And because he loved the Israelites, I believe he knew something that we didn't know. Maybe, maybe if Pharaoh had let him go on the second day, he, had, he would have changed his mind and been able to catch up to him and capped him, re-enslaved him, and it had been ten times worse. I don't know, maybe if he'd let him go on the third day, the Israelites would have been like, hey, you know that Pharaoh guy, he was pretty forgiving, he wasn't that bad, and they'd have voluntarily went back. We don't know the outcomes, but God does. God works all things together for the good of those that he loves. You see, we may not know the why, but we know the who. And we know that we can trust God because he is faithful and he is just and he loves us. I don't know why he would have hardened Pharaoh's heart, but I know that he had his children in mind when he did it. So the next step to work, breaking a works-based mentality is to exalt God's plans above my own. 
to exalt God's plans above my own. Even when I think I have it all planned out and it's going to go perfect and it's the best thing for my life, if that's not God's plan for your life, it'll never work. And you're going to go through so much more trouble and chaos than you would have if you'd have just followed God the whole way. Exalt God's plans above your own. Now Paul's going to go on and answer the question that he, he figures they're going to ask. Is it unfair for God to punish people for this? It goes on in verse 20. No, don't say that. Who are you? And this is this actually whole scripture, this whole passage right here is a direct reference to uh, Isaiah. So it says, who are you, a mere human being to argue with God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have the right to, to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those on whom his anger falls, who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for glory. And, and we are among those whom he selected, both the Jews and from the Gentiles. Now, I'll say one thing. This, this verse where he says they are destined for destruction. It seems like in, in an initial reading, that, they, that God has prepared them for destruction. But the actual Greek here is actually a word that means preparing, as in they are preparing themselves for destruction. And he's actually saying that God has patience on those that are preparing themselves for destruction, meaning that had God chosen to, he could have eliminated Pharaoh in the blink of an eye, but he allowed him time. If we go back and read, he actually gave him an opportunity to follow God. God is patient with those that are currently preparing themselves for destruction. But he will work all things for good for those that he calls his children. Paul goes on to talk about several prophecies about, and in this point, I'm not going to completely go over this like I have everything else, but in this point he's talking about why it's okay that God calls the Gentiles. And he references a bunch of prophecies where those that don't know God will come to God and be called his children. But then he kind of sums it up, and this is the, the big picture of the whole chapter. Right here, starting in verse 30. What does all this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel, who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in Him. They stumbled over the great rock in their path. The entire chapter can be summed up in that one line. They were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting him. That they were trying to get right with God by their own works, by their own merit. They were trying to be good enough that they would be right with God. The problem is, we read a few chapters ago in Romans that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? That we, we have all messed up, that we have all failed, we have all fallen short. So anytime we try to do anything on our own merit, if we're trying to reach God on our own merit, we will always fall short because we are not created for that. We are called to put our trust in Jesus. We are called to give Jesus our entire lives. You see, the Jews at this time, they were stuck in a works-based mentality. If I simply work hard enough, if I do enough, if I strive enough, if I, if I pray enough, if I memorize enough scripture, then I'll be made right with God. But Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and life. There's no other way to the Father except through him. That the only way to the Father is through him. But we so often end up in the same workspace mentality, don't we? That we are going to, we're going to fight and we're going to strive and we're going to struggle and we're going to work really, really, really hard and we're going to get right with God. Or we're going to work really, really, really hard and that problem we're facing will just disappear. Or we're going to figure everything out and we're going to solve all of our life's problems and, and then maybe we can fit God into our lives. God is saying that we have it backwards. For the final step of breaking a workspace mentality, 
is to invite God in. Invite God in. Revelation 3.20 says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. God is saying, I am here. Invite me in. Imagine for a moment, God is, is knocking at the door of your life. And, and you open the door and God says, hey, how are you? Can I come in and help out? And, and, and we immediately recoil, right? Because we're like, God, you, you, you can't come in here because it's a mess, okay? It is an absolute mess mess. I can't, listen, here's what I'm going to do. You just, you, you go over there, and I'm going to work really, really hard, and I'm going to clean up all of this, and this will be spotless, and then you, you can come on in, okay? You just go over there, and God's like, okay. And then God comes back, and he says, hey, are you okay? You seem really stressed out. I just want to come in and help. And we're, God, no, I, I can't let you into this. You're, you're too good for this. This is, this is my mess. I'll clean it up. But God is standing there saying, child, you're working too hard. Child, you're trying too hard. You're striving too hard. You see, you're trying to handle what you were never meant to handle all on your own. You see, you were created for a purpose. You see, I come in and I clean up and I rebuild and I bring light into dark situations. You are loved and I'm here on your side. Child, you're talking about rebuilding things. I rebuild lives. I rebuild souls. I am a carpenter. It is what I do. But we are trying to keep God out of our dark situations. That we are trying to keep God out of our mess and that's where he wants into the most. He says, child, invite me in. This situation that you're in, it's not too deep for me. It's not too dirty for me. I came to earth to get in the dirt. I laid on the cross and I took the sins of the world on me. Your dirt is not too big for me. You don't have to clean it up on your own. You don't have to fight it on your own. You don't have to bear that weight on your own because my burden is light and my weight is easy. God is saying to you, invite him in. And it's powerful that he came to the Gentiles because the Gentiles are anyone who was not Jewish. They were thought of as unclean. They were thought of as dirty, as wretched, someone that God would want nothing to do with. But he comes in, and who does Jesus go to? He first, he goes to the Gentiles. He comes to the people that were unclean, that were dirty, that did not deserve Jesus in their lives. That's who God came to. So wherever you are, and whatever you're facing, and however low you think you are, Know that you are not outside the love of God, that God came for you, and that mess that you think you've got to clean up on your own, he wants in the middle of it. He's not waiting for you to clean up your act, and he's not waiting for you to come to church, and he's not waiting for you to read enough of your Bible and to cover up your tattoos. He wants to come to you where you are. That is the God that we serve. And that's what makes him greater than any other idea that anyone else has, is because he's a God that did not come to get things from us, but to bring things to us that he came to serve you, that he came to put himself beneath his own creation so that he could hang on a cross and pay the ultimate debt for sin and death. That is the God we serve. And what Paul is trying to say to these Jewish followers is stop. Quit trying to earn your way to God. Put your faith and your trust in Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And wherever you are, you are not too far gone. He came for you where you are. That's the big picture. When we focus on the details, we may miss that God is calling you where you are and who you are. That when you look in the mirror and you pick out all of your flaws and the enemy is sitting there whispering in your ear that you are useless and that you are worthless and that there is nothing that you have a purpose for. God is sitting there screaming back, tell that enemy to shut his mouth because I am the God that will crush his head beneath my foot. I am the God of all creation and have I called you and I have set you apart. That you are loved, you are redeemed, that you are sanctified, you are justified in me. That enemy has nothing else to say. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. Wherever you are, 
whatever you're facing, however much you are struggling and not moving anywhere, you are called to be a child of God. Hold your head high. This world will not defeat you because he has overcome the world. You are loved. You are chosen. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you came for us, for the broken, for the messed up, for those who that cannot earn our way to righteousness when we look at the law we know we can't complete. God, I thank you that you chose us, that you love us, no matter what we're facing, what we're going through, what our darkness looks like, that you are a light in the darkness. God, you are so, so good. God, you know our pains and our struggles. You know the trials that we're in, the, the times that we can't move through. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here in the midst, that you would be with each and every person in this room. God, you know the struggles and the trials, God. I pray that you would help them, Father, that you would lift them up, that you would let them feel you and hear you and understand you, that you would give them confidence in their weak situation, Father. We lift you up today, that we know you are the one that overcomes everything. God, that you are the great I am. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, we love you. We trust you. Amen.